Hello, everyone, and welcome to Medhead Osnet Podcast, Season 2, Episode 3, live on YouTube and Facebook, and now Twitter. And now Twitter. Uh, yeah. I'm your host, Vika Line, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Mike Balian, where we discuss our great army in history, covering different people, eras, topics. It's Thursday, January 27th. Happy Thursday to everyone. How are you, Mr. Balian? Always excellent. Did you rest well today? We got a great show. God, no, it's Thursday, man. There's work. <laughs> Stuff to do. Oh, what happened? We just lost video. Oh, there we go. Okay, we're back. Um, so, uh, you know, before we, uh, well, first of all, we have a great show today, and our special guest is Professor of Art History from UC Davis, uh, Hernard Wattenpa. I think I pronounced that right, uh, who is uh, patiently waiting us in the online green room. <laughs> green room. Uh, we'll be discussing uh, cultural heritage and her, and her book, The Missing Pages, which in my, right here, it's in, in my opinion, uh, is a fascinating read. You guys should get it. We'll mention all that stuff later. Yeah. Um, now, we've, before we bring her on, originally our guest today was going to be Umid Kurt, but he is he under the Ill. weather. Yeah, he's ill. Uh, we wish him a speedy recovery. Uh, and uh, Hernard was was scheduled to be here on the 24th, yeah. and she was nice enough to swap, swap slots, out, yeah. <laughs> basically. Yeah. Uh, so we're thankful for that. Uh, Umit will be back with us on February 24th, 9 p.m. Pacifico Standard Time. We That's an unusual time for us, but the only reason we're doing it late is because- He's From Israel. He resides in Israel. Yeah. Um, next Saturday, we have our next live, which will be with Ruth Tomasian and Arto Vaughn from Project Save. This is Saturday, February 5th, 11 a.m. Pacific Coast Standard Time, 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern. And the reason is on a Saturday early because they are in the East Coast um, and they couldn't be here Thursday nights with us. So we're making an exception. Uh, if you guys don't know much about Project Save, um, basically Project Save collects documents, documents, preserves, and shares images of all time periods relating to Armenian people uh, and uh, the work of Armenian photographers, uh, they have collected over 60,000 good archives, photos yeah. dating back from 1870s. So that's just fascinating. And we can't wait to have the live with them. Um, if you guys uh, haven't listened to our last episode, which is the Arshakuni Dynasty Part 1, make sure you download it, listen to it. I even listened to it. Oh, you did? Yeah. How did that happen? I don't know. I just had a little bit of time on my hands. All right. Well, uh, part two will be available next week. So, um, but, you know, without any further ado, I want to bring our guest on. So everybody, welcome, Hernar Wattenpa. So, hi, Hernar. Hey. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for thank, having me. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it, especially sh such short notice. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Thanks for pulling the switch. I, I, I sent her an email like Monday morning <laughs> and she's like, yeah, great. I was like, awesome. Panic, <laughs> panic, panic, <laughs> panic. Um, <laughs> we've never had this situation like this where a guest cancels. So, you know, it was just weird. But thank you so much. We appreciate yeah, it. I think we have a great this. show. Um, before we start kind of talking about the topics and, and, and the book and what you do, but I wanted you to kind of introduce yourself to our audience, uh, and, uh, kind of give us a background of where you're from, um, you know, how you ended up kind of getting into, you know, history and, and just a quick bio about yourself. Sure. Um, I'm from Beirut. I grew up in Beirut. Maybe there are some people out there listening from Beirut, um, and uh, when I was growing up, it was during the Civil War, and um, I didn't really know that there was such a thing as art history. I mean, I knew there was art, the art world, and people who wrote about art, art critics. But I didn't really know that there was an academic discipline called the history of art. So when um, I was an undergraduate at UCLA, actually, and uh, I met a friend, um, Lisa Arakelian Boyajian. Maybe she's listening to us. She lives in LA and she was an art history major. And she told me, you know, it's really great. You should take one of my courses with me. And uh, I did. And it was a course on Chinese art. And that was it. Uh, that's how I got into this. Um, so uh, that was my path. And um, 
for a very long time at the beginning of my career, I worked on Syria and Turkey. And uh, after the Syrian civil war, um, obviously I no longer do field work there. So I now work on um, Turkey and the Republic of Armenia and a little mm. bit of Artsakh. Great. Uh, how long have you been with, at UC Davis? As, as far About as 15 years. Wow. Yeah, wow. it's the years. longest place I've lived. Uh, other than Beirut, it's the longest place I've lived in. Wow, that's awesome. 15 years. Um, it's a well, lot of dedication. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank, <laughs> thank, thank you for what you're doing. It's it's amazing. And, and uh, we're excited to have you here and, and talk about this great topic. So, um, we, we can start, we have questions yeah. for you, yeah, if that's okay. Questions that could probably lure <laughs> us into other rabbit holes, I guess. Um, <laughs> right? But yeah. Uh, so are you ready? Absolutely. All right. Awesome. All right. Let's start. So, um, as a professor of art history who studies or, or, you know, your main focus is on, uh, cultural, cultural heritage. Can you elaborate to what that means for our audience and its connection with history? Sure. So um, the history of art in, in general, deal, you know, we study artworks, either historic artworks or artworks that were created yesterday. And we think about how they were created, why they were created a particular way, what do they mean, what is the role that they play in society and so on. And that's one wonderful way of doing art history. Uh, cultural heritage is both a practice and a product, and it's the way in which you take objects from the past, whether they're works of art, Picassos, or whether it's your grandmother's old handbag. So you take things, material things from the past, and you make them meaningful in the present through uh, museum displays or through other kinds of practices. And the idea is also to preserve these valuable cultural items for future generations. So that's what cultural heritage is. It's taking items from the past, making them meaningful in the present. So you're always thinking about what does this artwork mean to us now, whether it was created yeah. yesterday yeah. or 10,000 years ago. So it's a slightly different branch of thinking about art, art history. Okay. Sure. But there's, there's always, you know, any item that's ever found, you know, we can always, anytime it, well, I've ever gone to a museum or anybody's ever gone to a museum, let's say for instance, or something that's on display, you always end up asking a lot of questions about whatever this is, where yeah, it came course. from. Right. So that's its connections oh, and, and the, the story that it tells what time period it was found in, who were these people and you know, what were their influence at the time? Yeah, you know, so on and so forth. Now, are you constant? You said you're concentrating on Turkey and Armenia, right? So, uh, are you currently? Or what kind of? Can you give examples of items that you have worked on recently that are, you know, part of court, uh, cultural her uh, cultural heritage? <laughs> the same yeah. problem. <laughs> cultural yeah. heritage. Cultural heritage. <laughs> All the words we stumble on, <laughs> I stumble on this one. <laughs> So right now, I'm really interested in thinking about how uh, cultural, the cultural and religious heritage of Ottoman Armenians it is seen and experienced today, whether it's in Turkey, like when you go to the um, you know, ruins of the city of Ani, which is today located in Eastern Turkey, and it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, yeah. whether it is um, the artwork that's on the cover of my book, which is um, a work of art that was created in present-day Turkey. It's an Armenian gospel book, and part of it is in, is in Los Angeles at the Getty yeah. Museum, yeah, well. or uh, whether whether you're encountering medieval Armenian art in a place like the Republic of Armenia, which is a modern republic. So how do we encounter medieval Armenian art there? So that, that's what I'm interested in. I see. I see. Interesting. Um, now, as a professor at UC, UC Davis, um, do you teach only uh, history of art or multiple types of classes? Yeah, I, I'm in the art history department, and my um, uh, field of art history is Islamic art, so uh, art produced in the Islamic world. 
And uh, that that's my area of specialization. And I teach classes in that. And I love it. And I also have a series of classes that are that have to do with um, art history, cultural heritage, and human rights. So what this is, is the approach that I take to the study of cultural heritage is the framework of human rights. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Um, you know, human rights are universal, you know, if any human has human rights, uh, wherever they're from, whatever their particular situation in life. And in terms of cultural heritage, uh, for a human rights perspective, it's very important to emphasize that our approach to cultural heritage should be universal, and it should be inclusive. And uh, access to, cult to the cultural heritage of your community or the cultural heritage of others is a very important value. And so cultural heritage, any human should be able to access cultural heritage without discrimination. I see. So uh, act human rights activism and cultural heritage is very important in the art world right now. Mm -hmm. And you encounter it in all kinds of ways, movements for social justice in the museum. You know, maybe you've heard the, you know, decolonize this museum movement where people want to see objects that were uh, that have arrived in museums as a result of having been looted in the past mm -hmm. in colonial times, though so people who want to see these objects restituted, that kind of movement is inscribed in this sort of human rights approach Basically, to cultural heritage. Yeah, taking it away from the collectors or the black market and, yeah. and having it in museums. Now, as far as your classes, uh, is uh, what is your average student count, let's say? How many students do actually join your classes as far as when it's, it comes to? Uh, the uh, art, art history and, and human rights class is huge. Uh, it, 120 students every year, and there's always people wow. who want to get in. Students today are really interested in these issues, and these debates are at the forefront of the art world now. So it... Um, it's incredible. I didn't, when I was creating the course, I did it because I thought it was important and I was really interested in these issues, but the response has been amazing. And we talk about all kinds of issues. It's not just the Middle East or Armenian uh, cultural heritage. It's everything. Uh, it's a, we take a global perspective and it's hard. It's a difficult class because they have to think about legal frameworks. They have to, you know, read archaeology. They have to read really academic art history stuff, yeah. but they do it because they, they're really young people today. It really gives me hope to say this <laughs> are really invested in these issues. They really care. Yeah. Especially, I mean, it ties into history, which is so important. Mm -hmm. I think that's the, biggest problem we see uh in our culture or even other cultures is that we feel like the young generation is so caught up with you know the the technology and and their ipads and iphones and everything like they, they they're the way we grew up at least we had sure. some but, but you i know, mean look I, the, it was not, installed in us to, uh, to their to their benefit they have i mean everything's at their fingertips of course but right? do they use it well, that's another question, of course, yeah. um, it, to each their own, I guess. But um, a one one question I wanted to ask you that kind of piggybacks off of Vic's question is your your class is demographic for the most part. Um, what I mean, I know your your area of focus is specific to a certain region of the world, right? But what's the demographic like? Are you getting mostly Middle Eastern students or are you getting people from all over, you know, who join in on these classes? all over really? there's no I, and i i'm amazed like there, okay. i when i go into the classroom i don't know who's going to be there the the one group of students who consistently come are students who are really interested in design and mm -hmm. tiles because of course in islamic yeah. art there's an incredible yeah. tradition of tiles and great design Mosaic art. so yeah. i know that this group is always going to show up but otherwise i get all kinds of people from all corners of the campus. And, um, you know, people who are interested in agriculture, people whose major is uh, engineering, um, people who are interested in humanities issues, a lot of political science students. Uh, but I, I have uh, one time I tried to do a, a survey of why students are taking this class so I could understand them better. And uh, the only common answer was it's because it's not too early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Maybe that's my secret. <laughs> what time is well, your class? Does the class start? <laughs> 1 p.m. Okay. Right after lunch. It's, it's, it's morning for most college students, I can imagine, right? Yeah. Or after lunch, you know, when you just ate and go relax and listen to some great lectures. <laughs> oh, get the, man. They get the day started off right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that that's awesome. Um, well, uh, let's see. Next question. You want? Okay, yep. Do you want to go ahead? No. Go ahead. Go oh, ahead. That's right. the question. Yeah. So, um, what's the relate? Well, let let's talk about um the relationship. Well, you already kind of sort of covered the relationship between cultural her heritage and human rights. Um, is there um anything f that let's say some touching points from that area of the region that you tend to discuss more with your classes? Is there some sort of topic that let's say is a little bit more of a fire? that people want mm -hmm. to discuss or the students want to discuss? Is there anything that occurs like this, like naturally with the ebbs and flows of your class? Mm -hmm. So the human rights class, it really, uh, it really depends. Um, there's a couple, uh, and uh, I have to go by areas where I can find enough materials for the students to sink their uh, teeth into. Um, and uh, today, I think, is Holocaust Remembrance Day. So mm -hmm. I have um, a unit uh, in the class where we think about the role of the destruction of uh, Jewish cultural heritage and Jewish religious heritage in the Holocaust and the Nazi looted art because the Nazis were yeah. very yeah. interested in amassing fabulous art collections looted from, among others, uh, major uh, European Jewish art collectors. Um, and the ongoing battle that goes on until today to recover some of these uh, Nazi looted uh, artworks that are in various collections around the world. So uh, there, that's one unit that we work on. There's a lot of interesting things to read. Um, and to think about and to think about a lot of these issues having to do with um, legality, ownership, mm -hmm. uh, but also what is the right thing to do? What does restitution mean? Um, uh, you know, what does it mean that a uh, part and parcel of genocide is destruction of culture, destruction of yeah. religious heritage? Why is that so central? It's not collateral damage. It is very intentional. So uh, these are the kinds of issues we talk about. In the past, we've also um, uh, talked about um, uh, archaeology, especially colonial period archaeology and its problems, um, our archaeology and racial injustice. We've talked about the right to the city, urban movements, urban justice movements. So it's really um, every year is different because different, I feel that yeah. there are so many interesting issues um, and I try out all new ideas. We did art of protest one year and that was fun. Students well, really like, like that. Yeah, I could imagine it changes, yeah. especially with the current yeah. climate of, you know, of the global situation all over, not just in this country, but yeah. all over the place. I'm sure that probably sparks a ton of new topics yeah. to be mm -hmm. especially for mm -hmm. you to maybe potentially discuss with the students mm -hmm. we uh spent some time last time uh it was last time i taught it it was right after the summer of black lives matter so mm -hmm. we talked about statues and uh statues that need to come down and what what are the different points of view yeah. Uh, yeah what are the different debates and what is the right thing and how do you get at that and if you're an activist how do you go about advancing your point of view um what is it how do you what one important thing is to uh, be able to communicate your point of view clearly and powerfully so how important it is to have all your facts at your fingertips but also to be able to articulate them well to write well so it's it's a hard class but students love it yeah mm -hmm. you know um I, I have an interesting question that an audience member brought up uh and i'm going to put it on the the screen right now to show and he say, well, what about history falsification? Are there any measures planned by the university or, or government to prevent those falsifications? And this is by mm -hmm. Al Gray. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's his yeah, real name. That's, <laughs> a, um, uh, that's a great question because um, y y one of the... Uh, in many disputes, there's um, always disputes over the facts. What is the truth? How do you get at the truth? 
And so you're, you want to be able, if you're an activist, if you're somebody who approaches your um, field of cultural heritage with the human rights framework, you have to be able to present a powerful case um, where you, you have your facts and your facts are accurate and you can prove them and you can make a powerful argument. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's also important. I think that the, this uh, person's question brings up the issue that, um, you know, there are battles over memory. I mean, there today is again, Holocaust Memorial day. There are people today who, uh, deny that the Holocaust took place, Yeah, you yeah. know, we even, isn't this that is unbelievable? a historical fact that we think is so well established, you know, but no, I mean, we, anti-Semitism continues to exist. So um, I think this, he's, your, he or she uh, brings up a very important question. Uh, and if you have a, um, a human rights approach to things, you, you want to be on the right side of, of history, on the right side of facts. And what do you do when it's difficult to discover that? I mean, there are very difficult areas in human rights work. Oh, I, oh, I can imagine. Yeah. I can imagine. Um, you know, there's it's probably a lot of influence depending on who you're dealing with, no? Of course. Yeah. Yeah, I could yeah. imagine. Um, I mean, that question kind of leads me into the next question, which I wanted to ask you is, uh, with the current situation in Armenia, especially Artsakh, yeah. um, in your opinion, uh, you know, with your teachings, uh, why is cultural heritage so important, mm -hmm. especially for, for this region with, with what's happening? Well, I think, um, especially in the Armenian community globally, we've become really aware of cultural heritage and how fragile it is uh, during the war and since the war. Um, and we're very aware of the threats to cultural heritage as a result of war, as a result of discrimination, as a result of racial hatred. And uh, un unfortunately, this is a global phenomenon. It's not just a phenomenon limited to the Armenian cultural heritage of Artsakh. Um, and it's important to, to see how this fits in this global phenomenon where we see cultural heritage under attack in so many places under cover of war or even in peacetime. So one of my missions in my teaching is to always show my students that cultural heritage, the art, art and architecture from the past are an incredible resource that we have in the present, but they're very fragile. And so we all have to be activists in their preservation and understanding and transmitting it to the future, not just in this, we should do this not only for the cultural heritage that we feel close to, that we feel an affiliation with, but we should take a, um, a more um, inclusive and global approach to cultural heritage. And I think what the situation in Artsakh shows very clearly is that cultural heritage can become really politicized mm -hmm. and it, it becomes instrumentalized by various groups. And, um, and that can be a very dangerous situation. Money, lobbying power. Money, lobbying power, yeah. um, the, the powerful interests. Mm -hmm. uh, but so it's 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 one of those examples where you have a very very difficult situation. And for me, coming from, I mean, being somebody who has spent a lot of time studying Syria and having witnessed um, the failures of the international community in yeah. preserving human rights in Syria in general, and in preserving cultural heritage in Syria, it's very sobering to think about what is happening in Artsakh and, uh, what dangers loom ahead. So, um, I'm, I, I think it's, it's a very um, positive thing that so many people are now aware of the importance of cultural heritage and the dangers of cult that loom over cultural heritage um, in times of conflict and as a mm -hmm. result of um, you know, ethnic hatred. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I think that our work as activists is only beginning in that now we have to find ways to preserve that cultural heritage for all and uh, find out all means, figure out how we can 
do that and how we can uh, build peace. And it's, it's very difficult to do yeah. when, yeah. you know, you, um, you need, you need powerful forces to align with this goal in order to advance this agenda. Absolutely. You do. You need, yeah. you need some backing, especially with dealing with our, our current situation. Now, uh, have you worked with UNESCO as far as, yeah. uh, you know, um, with the off have, situation? I have not, um, worked with them directly, but, um, I've, uh, I've followed, uh, what they say very closely. And, mm. um, I also followed statements by other groups, uh, within the United Nations and international cultural heritage. And the difficulty of the situation in Artsakh and also many other places is that in the, the way in which the international political system, the inter international cultural heritage is set up, is that states have a lot of power. Uh, and it's usually states that are responsible for the upkeep of cultural heritage that falls on their territory. Mm -hmm. So see. if a state... Um, uh, in, in this case, Azerbaijan uh, considers Armenian cultural heritage in Artsakh to be on its territory. And UNESCO has applied to, uh, UNESCO can't just show up and say, we're going to, we want to organize a fact-finding mission. They can only operate with the consent of the state where the cultural heritage is located. Wow. So if a state is unwilling or unable for whatever reason, then um, so the... Yeah. So, so, the, so the question beckons, I guess, is uh, if, it, from your knowledge, um, does UNESCO cooperate or I'm sorry, does, let's say, for instance, Azerbaijan it cooperate with UNESCO or anything, anyone such as UNESCO? Um, I know we asked that to Christine Maranci about Turkey being, you know, open yeah. to having some of those things from ancient audience, you know, the eastern part of Turkey well protected and allowing archaeologists to go yeah, in right yeah, yeah so i'm wondering from if you have any information on that currently because the, the situation i wouldn't call it fresh but it's a lot more younger mm -hmm. what what do you know about what's going on w in with the current situation in terms of protecting some of those things in mm -hmm. now the azerbaijani well not just protecting borders. i mean they're changing things yeah they are changing things and yeah. hence you know hence why the question is is there any effort to, to stop this the current situation is that um, the areas that are controlled by the Azerbaijani government, no international monitoring missions have been allowed to come. Uh, UNESCO has been declined, um, Blue Shield has been declined, and wow. a number of other organizations. And, you know, a state has the right to welcome these groups or not welcome these groups. So it's uh, it's the way the system se it's, is set up that... Um, favors states because unesco after all is an intergovernmental organization right it's it's an organization made up of states um so armenia for example is a state and has um some um some things that they can some rights uh with unesco but if you're an indigenous community whether it's in artsakh or it's in a south american country or the united states for example then you are not a state and so you you do not have that kind of voice. Does that not though hold some sort of weight? The fact that let's say an indi indigenous community has been there for let's say a hun hundreds of years, maybe thousands, even thousands, thousands of, years, of years, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and mm -hmm. this could go for anybody. Anybody yes. it doesn't necessarily have to be yes. Armenia in yes in Artsakh or anywhere in that region, just anywhere. Does that not hold some sort of weight for for your consideration, so to speak? That's where you know? that's where a human rights approach, I think, yeah. is really critical because when you're a group where you're in a situation where um, you your voice is not valued or is not heard, you have to make your voice heard. Yeah. And so, how do you do that within the channels that are available to you? And I think that's where uh, human rights activism has to meet cultural heritage preservation. Yeah. And I'm not saying it's easy. No, no, no. It's it's, a, not. it's, a, it's, a, it's harder like than a really difficult. Yeah, situation. I, I I mean, it's, it's a no very difficult task. It, yeah. To now, before I ask you the next question, one of our audience, and, and this is going to lead into kind of talking about the book. 
Uh, this is from Arlene. Let me put it up on the screen. And uh, her question is, can you dis can you read it? Can you see it? Okay, yes. her question is, yeah. Can you discuss the matter of di digitizing images of illuminated manuscripts as from a uh, form of preservation in the uh, in record in case of distribution through time over war? Thank you, Eileen. This is a really great uh, question. And in fact, there's a branch of cultural heritage called digital cultural heritage, where people think about these issues. And I'll give you the example of um, a friend of mine, a very dear friend of mine, Professor Nancy Um, who is a specialist of um, Islamic art in Yemen. And of course, what has been happening in Yemen over the last few years, uh, a terrible, terrible war, one of the worst humanitarian disasters in the world. And so she and um, a group, uh, several other groups in cooperation with um, a library in an endangered area in Yemen have been working on digitizing manuscripts that, um, that are located in, in the highlands of Yemen now that they feel it's just a matter of time they are going to be destroyed um so um it's it's heroic to try to digitize these um these priceless and unique cultural objects but uh once the original is gone it's gone yeah so a digital copy however wonderful is does not replace the original it no. is its own thing it, it's valuable it's incredibly valuable but um, again, you, the cultural heritage is fragile. These um, items that have come down to us uh, from centuries before that were created by humans centuries yep. before yep. Uh, that contain their hopes and dreams and their ideas, the stories, yeah, their stories. Uh, they they are our responsibility. Uh, of, course, it, of course, and so I'm I'm very. Uh, pro preservation we have to figure yes. out ways to preserve them for the future and sometimes digital preservation is the only hope you have yeah yeah but it's not a replacement but no, again that this all. digital cultural heritage is a whole huge area um, of research right now but that's a great question thank you Aline well, I mean, you know, we, we, in all the episodes we've had, and especially with uh, Haraj, when we talked about, you know, yeah. the rugs yeah. uh, that come yeah. from thousands of years ago, you know, these rugs told stories and, and amazing, you know, things that have taken place and so many different type of artifacts. And um, that when, when it's destroyed without any care, it's just, you know, I think part of it is also, you know, you've seen videos of them destructing things. It's like, they just, it's ignorance you know, at the another, same time. Another big portion of it is, is some of these manuscripts you see from different cultures, including our own, mm -hmm. beautifully put together, ornate, beautiful colors, the time it took for, for whomever it was to put this together. You're never going to be able to see that in front of your face physically. Yeah, yeah. If you ever visited a place like that's, that's, I think to me, that's the biggest travesty in this. Yeah. yeah right. It's yeah. Di digital is one thing. Yeah. But just being able to see something, maybe you can't touch it, obviously, but just being able to see it right in front of your face. Oh, unless and you have VIP access. Maybe well, you can. <laughs> I mean, with, with manuscripts that old, they typically, yeah. from what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, they're not going to let you touch yeah, that. Yeah. You know, their oxidization <laughs> and all this stuff, yeah. they're not going to let you touch it. Um, so, but yeah, anyway, so um, let's move on to your wonderful book, um, The Missing Pages. Um, what made you write this book and what is it about? So um, this book uh, was born when I uh, in I read a news item on TMZ of all places uh, where I learned that um, the Armenian church in Los Angeles had sued the Getty. And this uh, over um, a fragment of a manuscript that the Getty had that the church said had been stolen during the Armenian genocide. And this really surprised me because um, uh, I had never heard of this artwork um, and I didn't know the story. And um, I, I was very surprised that um, um, uh, the situation existed. I was very intrigued and I tried to learn more. Yeah. And uh, the more I tried to learn, the more this manuscript just 
<laughs> yeah. lured me in. You went through the um, you went into the rabbit hole. <laughs> it became, it, it became it really a part did. of you. Yeah. yeah. It really did. Yeah. And I became obsessed. Um I mean it is I mean many people believe I believe too this is no ordinary manuscript. This is yeah. a sacred object that has power over people and it certainly had me in its thrall. Now, when did you start your research? Like as far as, I mean, because the book was released in 2019. Um, how long did it take you to? Um, it I went through many different kinds of iterations. Uh, first, I thought, oh, you know, I'm going to write a little opinion piece about this. Um, and so I, um, you know, tried to read more about the manuscript. Then I became more and more interested about uh, on the various issues that it raised so for example um was this a work of art as sort of the getty would describe it it, it certainly is incredibly beautiful and created with great aesthetic talent by Toro roslin the greatest medieval uh, armenian illuminator or is it a sacred object like the church argued uh, can an object be those two things at the same time? So if, if for an art historian, these are very important issues. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and are these two mutually exclusive? Um, do we have to choose one? So I became really, really interested. And for a while, I thought I would write a book about Armenian cult what happened to Armenian cultural heritage after the genocide. And um, these missing pages were going to be one chapter. And uh, there were, you know, seven other chapters with seven other examples. But then that first chapter became the book. Yeah. <laughs> it was very that's, clear that that's there how were deep you more, with this. more things. <laughs> so people sometimes ask me, you wrote a whole book about just eight pages. <laughs> wow. And, that's how, and that's, I, I mean, feel that's like how... I've barely scratched the surface. I but yeah, I mean, more books about those eight pages. Really? Yes, there's oh, that yeah. much, there's really? So there's so that much, much information. information. Okay. Uh, All right. I got to start. I mean, this, it, this it's weekend. a great book. No, but you did. You, I mean, you mentioned the book that did you did write an op-end, right? About it. And, yeah. and you were kind of like people weren't too happy with it. <laughs> Not too happy with it, uh, but I'll point out that the final settlement between the church and the Getty bears a resemblance to the, the solution that I proposed at the time. But um, uh, but I think the, the discussion, the debate around these issues has also evolved. Yeah. Uh, when I just, uh, just jumped into these topics, that was about 10 years ago. And now the discussion about these issues has really evolved. Um, so it's a very interesting oh. time to think about these issues. Now, I know those, those, those years of you researching has taken you through many adventures, but to, to give an idea of the audience to understand it. And then we want people, you guys got to get, get this book. You can go to Amazon and just search for the missing pages, or you can also search with her name and it will come up. Please get it. It's a great book. Uh, I haven't, I started it on Monday. Yeah. I haven't finished it yet. Yeah, but he was he was I already mean, have not. He was already he was already bragging to me about it uh, last night. I'm not gonna lie, yeah. he was. Um, oh, I'm so happy. But but can you give uh you know to, so people understand what was the lawsuit about between the Getty Museum and the Armenian uh, Church, um, for them to understand, mm -hmm. and um, uh, you know what the lawsuit specifically was about, the demands of the church and how the Getty actually, uh, you know, the, their, their justification of how they, the acquisition of the uh, canon tables of, which is the Zaytun Gospels. And that's the one thing we forgot to mention. It's, you know, what it's about. Um, so if you can elaborate on that a little yeah. bit. Yeah. So um, the, the, the manuscript in question is called the Zaytun Gospels after the town of Zaytun in, you know, the old Ottoman Empire, mm -hmm. where this, uh, this book had uh, lived for several hundred years. Um, and it's been illuminated by Toros Roslin, the most important Armenian medieval illuminator. It is his first signed work. Um, and uh, so today this manuscript exists in two parts. 
eight pages that are the canon tables. They're, it's a type of uh, illumination. It's the introductory matter to the, a gospel book um, known as the canon table. So these eight illuminated pages are at, are at the Getty in Los Angeles. And the rest of the book has ended up um, in the Republic of Armenia at a museum called the Madenataran, uh, the mm-hmm. Mashtots Institute for Ancient Manuscripts. So, uh, oh, there it is. So yeah. here are uh, two of the canon tables that are today um, uh, at the Getty Museum. So the church in its lawsuit said that these eight pages that the Getty had in its possession had been removed uh, from the main manuscript as a result of the Armenian genocide. And therefore, they had been removed unlawfully. They are stolen property. And the church is the lawful owner of the um, mm-hmm. uh, of the manuscript. Uh, and the Getty argued, uh, no, we have purchased them uh, lawfully. So um, they uh, went into, I think, about five or six years of litigation and negotiation, very, very contentious. Um, and in the end, in 2015, the centennial year of the Armenian Genocide, uh, just weeks before we were supposed to go to court, um, they we, we uh, they were supposed to go to court in November 2015, and in September they announced a settlement. So they had reached an agreement, and according to the agreement, the Getty acknowledged that the pages were the property of the church. And um, the church, in turn, having taken possession of uh, these pages in the centennial year of the genocide, uh, donated the pages to the Getty so that the Getty would preserve them and make them available to the widest public. So that was yeah. the that was the uh, the story. But what was fascinating to me is I'm always interested. This is cultural heritage versus art history. I'm mm-hmm. I'm always interested in the relationship between this incredible sacred object and the community, the communities of people with whom this object spent time and created networks and social worlds. So I was always interested in the the entire biography of this manuscript. Who were the people that interacted with it? Um, uh, what, What did they think of it? How meaningful was it? to them in their lives. And so that became my mission is to understand how um, the the biography of this, the life of this manuscript had evolved over the 700 years of its existence. It was created in the middle of the um, uh, 13th century in 1256. That's that's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Um, now, I mean, we have some, if you don't mind, some audience, uh, I guess, brought up some questions. questions yeah. uh, we have Connor, or <laughs> Connor, you got to change your name, buddy. Uh, Connor Anderson, he's from Canada. Uh, are other nations having their churches or mosques sue the Getty rather than the government, or is it only Armenia? Um, uh, so, uh, Connor, it was not Armenia who was suing. It was yeah. the Armenian church in the United States. Yeah. The, the yeah. Republic of Ar- Armenia, excuse me, to my knowledge, has not uh, instituted any kind of lawsuit. Um, so, Connor's question was, are there other uh, Let's nations? Say, are there, yes. Yeah. Yes. Are there other the churches? Getty, that... The Getty has faced... Um, uh, you know, the Getty is a wonderful museum, uh, and it is a, a, a recently constituted museum, right? It was established in 1970, mm-hmm. um, according to the will of Mr. Getty. So their collection is uh, has been created relatively recently, and uh, there has been a number of, uh, of challenges. And if you're interested in this, Connor, there's an interesting book uh, called Chasing Aphrodite, by two Los I've Angeles Times. I've heard yeah, of that it's too. a it's a yeah. very it's a great read. Uh, it's written by two Los Angeles Times reporters, uh, Jason Felch and Ralph Framolino, who were nominated for a Pulitzer Prize for their work reporting on the Getty. And they do a really interesting job of really getting into these things. And they focus yeah. on one challenge from uh, the government of Italy, uh, who um, had a dispute with the Getty uh, that was later resolved. Um, 
Uh, Aline, I'm just saying, she asked, uh, are the pages uh, at the Getty Center now? They they are, right? Yes. They're, they're in display. Yes, yes you can. They're and not by the way, on she, display uh, right now yeah. because they have to, as uh, Mike said earlier, uh, manuscripts, you, they, their conservation issues are yeah. very, very complicated. So they're not on display right now. But um, on uh, February 17, uh, we're going to have a wonderful online event um, uh, with uh, the curator of uh, manuscripts at the Getty, Elizabeth Morrison, is going to talk about the canon tables. Um, the the the, um, the curator of the uh, Fowler Museum at UCLA is going to talk about an Armenian Gospels at U UCLA known as the um, uh, the Kalatsor Gospels, mm -hmm. and uh, a, a former guest on your show, I think Maggie Goshen of the Ararat Eskitian yes. Museum, yes. is going to be on that program too, and she's going to talk about a wonderful uh, liturgical object that she has in her own museum. So yeah. I think it's going to be a fantastic program. I, and this is this people can watch this online. Yes, it's going to okay. be an online program. Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay awesome. Um, uh, I, I have one more question. Uh, well, by the way, Aline got your book. So, technology. Thank you, Aline. You <laughs> 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 awesome. Um, it, and I think Al Gray again has a question saying, uh, "Let me bring this to the screen." Good question. Uh, his question is: uh, Is Armenian government active supporting it in any way when it comes to providing or receiving archives related to our issues? Uh, I'm not sure what Al Gray means by our issues, but uh, the Armenian government, the National Archives are open uh, with COVID protocols. And, um, you know, I've used them and they also have um, a series, some of it is digitized. Uh, they have a website and they've also published a lot of church archives. So because of my research, I'm interested in religious art, um, especially medieval Armenian religious art. I've used those volumes. So, um, yeah, the Armenian archives, uh, especially for historic periods, are open. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, hopefully um, that answers your question. Yeah, um, I have I have a follow up to a few of these things. Now, as you went on this journey to to research for this book, how long did it take you to find what you needed to complete the book, and what did you discover that was most surprising to you? So uh, the most time spent was, as always, figuring out what's the right question to ask. What, what is the best way to approach this? Um, and that's always the hardest. Um, Toros Roslin is a very well-known artist and a lot of really great art historians have worked on him and they've described his style, his influences and so on. So I felt that I didn't really have anything to add to the important things that they had already said. I'm talking about people like uh, Helen Evans, who is the curator of Byzantine art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, who wrote her PhD dissertation on Toros Roslin. Yeah. So I had to find a, a new approach, a different approach, um, uh, an approach that complemented their, uh, their method. So I wanted to retrace the steps of the life of this manuscript. So that, that's where I came up with this idea of going to the places where this manuscript had spent time and, um, figuring out what is there now and try to um, imagine the spatial, the space contexts where um, the this book had once been meaningful. So, and it was also a pilgrimage of sorts. So I um, went to the place where the book was created in present day Turkey in uh, a castle uh, called Hrom Gla in Armenian times, medieval times, and known as Rumkale today. Mm -hmm. And that's where uh, there was, um, you want to keep going forward if you yeah. can. Um, and uh, so, um, yeah, these are the wonderful cannon tables that yeah, are at the Getty. I want to get to that um, picture where you, I know there's pictures yeah. of the, uh that's the see. binding yeah gorgeous 
and it I'll go back to these. I'll bring it back on. But oh, yeah, this, here we are. Yeah. So, um, so this is the castle of Harongla, present day Rumkale, in um, a present day Turkey, not far from the city of Urfa. So mm-hmm. this, which doesn't look like much now, this is the Euphrates River. Um, in medieval times, this was a militarily very important castle. And the Catholicos, the head of the Armenian church, this was his um, you know, castle. And uh, the Catholicos, who was the patron of uh, Toros Roslin, Constantine the I, uh, was a very interesting guy. He had a very long reign. He was very important for his theological ideas, but he was also a patron of the arts, and he had assembled a workshop of uh, artists in uh, Rongla, uh, and Toros Rostin was one of them, and they created dazzling manuscripts and other works of art, of which a small fraction has survived. And what is at Romgla today? Not that much, you know, you would uh, would not be able to tell that Armenians had ever existed here. There is this tower that was probably from the 12th century and was probably part of a a larger building. And uh, on this facade, you see there are these two hachkars, uh, these two carved stele. And here you see that, uh, you know, something has happened here. Uh, yeah. Somebody has taken the trouble to come in and very surgically, very intentionally, they have removed one yeah. part of this carving, but not the other. Oops, sorry. Didn't mean to. So uh. what is uh, what is the part that they've removed? Yeah. They've uh, removed cross. the cross and yep. part of the writing. And the writing, yeah. you know, you can The letters. See, yeah, it was Jesus Christos. And yep. you can still see part of it, Jesus yep. Christ. So... You know, it, it was very, I realized then that it was really very important for me to come here and to see this. Um, why? Because, you know, restitution cases like the dispute with the Getty often uh, revolve around the idea of a return, that the object should return to the country from where it was removed or uh, to the community um, place of origination place of origination but when you see this and you go somewhere where Toros Roslin and his colleagues created a world class art that is collected around the world today and there's nothing there that says the word Armenian or recognizes that this community was ever here and when you see these kinds of mutilations you really you really understand that there's no return here and it's because of the genocide. It's because of the way in which over the course of the 20th century, Armenian cultural heritage has been treated in Turkey um, and how not only Armenian communities, but their physical traces have been removed or erased from Turkey. So it really complicates the issue of restitution. Yeah. So it was very important for me to to retrace the steps of the manuscript to try to understand its uh, its life in medieval times, but also the context of its life today. Um, we we have some questions. I, I don't know if you're seeing the comments, but we have one from I think this is a great question uh, from God and K. Um, perhaps you guys already asked, but well, we haven't, but, uh, wanted to ask what kind of ink dye was used to colorize the manuscript. Also, mm-hmm. uh, what is in the manuscript? Thanks, and let me bring that on the screen. Yeah. So Garen, um, the manuscript is a gospels, uh, book. So in the gospels, the new Testament, I don't know how familiar we are or what you remember from Sunday school, if you ever went to Sunday school, but, uh, the gospel, a gospel book is uh, a book that contains an excerpt from the Christian Bible. And that excerpt are the, the four gospels. So four narratives of the life of Christ. And usually these four books of the life of Christ in a a gospels manuscript are preceded by canon tables like the ones you see here. And canon tables, what you're seeing here is um, an architectural frame 
uh, and supported by some columns. And inside the columns, you see that there's a grid, right, with gold ink. Mm -hmm. And inside the grid, there are some letters. These are letters of the Armenian alphabet that stand for numbers. So what you're looking at is, you know, an index or an Excel sheet, if you will, with a bunch of numbers. Uh, what this is, is it was very important theologically uh, for medieval Christianity, because these canon tables are showing you um, it's a concordance list where in two or more of the four Gospels, the same episode in the life of Christ appears. So this is very important theologically because it shows that the four Gospels tell the same story, mm -hmm. where their points of convergence are. And for uh, medieval church fathers, it was also very important to show that the New Testament, the arrival of Christ, the triumph of Christianity, etc., is prefigured. Figured, it's prophesied in the Old Testament, and the canon tables do that. So you can see that these images to us, they're incredibly beautiful, but they also are doing very important theological work for medieval Christianity. And it's partly for that reason that canon tables are often the most aesthetically interesting, the most beautiful um, elements uh, of a gorgeous. manuscript, the ones that get the most gold leaf. And here you really see that Toros Roslin, you know, this is, you know, uh, he really is giving free reign to his creativity. Uh, these very lifelike birds and fruit. And the, the more you stare at these images, the more you experience, you know, what we art historians call visual events. You know, you see more things. It is, it becomes more and more. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting lost just true. staring at the I know. screen. It sure. is, it's incredible. It's, it is really incredible. And, um, you know, uh, kudos to the Getty. They have an amazing uh, digital heritage program. And images, these images that you're seeing on the screen, obviously these are archival images uh, created yeah. by them that they have graciously allowed me to use, but they also have an open content program. So you go to um, the Getty website and you can download these images. You can, you know, enlarge them on your computer screen and really, you know, you will spend hours lost yeah. in these incredible visual passages. I mean, you really see that Toros Roslin it, I mean, he's celebrated as a great master of medieval illumination. He really is. He oh, it's, really it's is beautiful. an astonishing it's, artist. Yeah. Wow. I, I can't take my eyes off it. I'm not going to lie. It's amazing. It's absolutely incredible. Wow. And we, it's amazing, even though this is not narrative painting. You know, you're not seeing uh, the birth of Christ or an annunciation or a crucifixion. crucifixion. You're not... It, there's no obvious story that is being told here, but it is uh, so beautifully crafted that it literally mesmerizes you. And um, medieval for medieval theologians, this kind of art was a medium for spiritual reflection. You were meant to look at this, to take your time looking at each page to compare facing pages they have subtle differences and similarities and uh, you know by doing this you're meant to reflect on the divine it's almost like as if it was designed for each individual to look at it and have their own experience like mm -hmm. like Agreed. like his experience would be different than mine experience like it's just it's me mesmerizing it's so beautiful yeah, I'm I'm just wondering if maybe there were other sort of means for this outside of, you know, the aesthetics, obviously. Um mm -hmm. you said they were used for table like a like a, almost like an index mm -hmm. of sorts, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um have there been just out of curiosity, I guess more question for myself, have there been any other suggestions or theories for anything like this to have been used for? Or is this like a conclusive um a uh, thing where it's it's basically an index just out of curiosity yeah because it looks um, so complex you know what is, i mean yes it, that's yes. why yes there's a lot of room for interpretation okay a lot of room for interpretation and um, for example this particular set so these are two facing pages originally toros roslin crafted these two to 
to be two facing pages. You mm -hmm. open the book and you see these two uh, side yeah. by side. So you are meant to go from one to the other, from one to the other. And you see that on one side, the roosters are striding very confidently towards this vase. Mm -hmm. And in the other, the roosters um, seem to be nibbling at something. Um, it's so it, it, there, yes, there I are, didn't, I didn't there even are, pick up on that. There are lots of interpretations. I mean, I'm not a theologian, but uh, others have suggested that um, are these metaphors for the soul drinking from um, the wisdom of, uh, of God, uh, the wisdom of the Bible? Uh, are we meant to um, to 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 uh, recognize in this lively depiction of nature? We're meant to recognize the hand of God. There are lots of interpretations, and uh, this is very rich material. And we also have medieval texts like uh, Saint Nerses Shnor Hali, mm -hmm. who was um, who is a saint in the Armenian Church and who was at Romgla, by the way. Um, about I think 50 years before Toros Roslin was there, that that's where he lived, and he wrote a commentary on canon tables where he offers his theological interpretation of the canon tables. So for medieval Christianity, canon tables are um, you know like a philosophical thing to think about. They um, are an, a theological argument that link the gospels together and link the Old Testament and the New Testament, but they're also an aesthetic medium through which you can have this contemplative experience. So it's it's deep. I mean, this is yeah. not to me. This no. is not just a beautiful thing. No, no, this no. is an incredibly deep work even, that can take you in all kinds of directions. Yeah, even I'm even looking at the patterns on the facade right above the the the. I mean, right above the columns, right? That that has to mean something. They, those are not just space fillers. Mm -hmm. You know, just mm -hmm. as an artist myself, those those cannot just be space fillers. Mm -hmm. They have to mean something. The color has to mean something. The pattern, the, the repetition of the patterns has to mean something. You know, um, mm -hmm. I, I, and, I can't, I still can't stop staring. <laughs> I know, I know. Like, I know. My focus See, I'm is completely the only one. On, no, no, no. My focus is completely on this thing. All I'm right, so trying to pick up on patterns. I'm, I'm going to play some Zen music for five minutes. Everybody's going to stare. Everybody be quiet and close your eyes. Um, now, uh, you know, uh, not to not to divert from the, these manuscripts, yeah. but, uh, you know, we had a uh, list. Uh, where is he? I lost his. Uh, oh, David Sakyan. He asked a question. Um, let me put it up on the screen. And he says, uh, has the professor come across any manuscripts from Artsakh? If so, what can she tell us about them? Yes. So uh, I have had the honor of coming across manuscript from Artsakh and in fact the Madina Taran, uh, the Mashtots Institute of Ancient Manuscripts in Yerevan, Armenia, has an exhibition right now of manuscripts created in monasteries in Artsakh. Uh, and I think it also has an online component. So if you go to that website, you will see that. And um, you see that there's a... Uh, there's many different styles. So Toros Roslin is, you know, on near the Mediterranean, sort of in that part of the world uh, where the medieval kingdom of Cilicia existed, the mm -hmm. Armenian kingdom of Cilicia. Artsakh is, you know, all the way over there in the Caucasus. On the other side. Yeah. And um, so they have lots of, it's the same Armenian Christianity. They have lots of commonalities. Um, uh, Artsakh gospel books also have canon tables. Um, but the style is very different. Um, I think very beautiful in a very different way. Very different way. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, hopefully that answers your question, uh, um, uh, David. And, um, you know, I, I, my, the question I want to ask you, because when I started reading the book, the prologue, it was so, I don't know, I just connected to the way you were talking about your experience. Um, can, can you share that experience while visiting the cities of Zaytun and Marash? 
uh, specifically how you were received by the locals. Mm -hmm. How um, how knowledgeable were they about the history of the Armenians in those cities? Because, uh, you know, uh, obviously some of them, they might be even Armenian themselves and they don't know it. Yeah. And most yeah. of all, how did you feel standing in our ancestral lands mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that feeling that the Turkish government is trying to so hard to erase our, our history from, 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 from that area, basically, as if we didn't exist? Yeah, thank you for that question, uh, Vic. It's, you know, I've, um, I've been going to Turkey for, I don't know, 20, 25 years. Um, um, you know, it's a very large country, yeah. uh, many sub-regions. Um, with, you know, a very rich uh, and ancient uh, layers of culture, of course, uh, with a wonderful Armenian community and a very activist uh, Armenian community. Um, but when you travel to, you know, um, the provinces, you know, far away from Istanbul to places where there aren't any Armenians anymore, um, it's, a, it's very, you know, it's very complicated it's uh, it's uh, it it's very it's very difficult it's it feels on the one hand it feels very familiar um you know in turkish society there's a wonderful tradition of hospitality in many ways the culture feels very familiar you know you meet people who are exactly like your uncle yeah. toros yeah. right yeah. uh they talk the same way and the mannerism it's very different very familiar but at the same time uh, you know why your uncle toros isn't here and yeah. and they know why you're there i mean they you know who else is going to go to marash if not an armenian right it's not a place like Marash, a wonderful city, but it's not really a city that's on the, you know, tourism circuit. Yeah. So yeah. when you're there, people know why you're there. And um, they're often very, very welcoming. And I, through a friend of a friend, a Turkish friend, I was able to connect to a local uh, historian and he was my host and my guide and he was a wonderful person and I got to meet his whole family. Um, and uh, there were certain things we did not discuss because I think he and I would have different opinions. But um, there, it, it's this very strange combination of feeling very warm and very familiar, but at the same time, the wounds and the silences are there. Yeah. And it's it's really it can be really traumatic. And I had a moment when. Um, I, um, well, I went to Zaytun with a group of friends, including my wonderful host. Um, and uh, I, uh, I stood on the citadel, what had once been the citadel of Zaytun, where the church was, where the Zaytun Gospels had been kept in a special relic box for centuries. Mm -hmm. And the, the church isn't there anymore. There's a very large Turkish flag. And from there, you have this incredible viewpoint where you're looking over the valley and these mountains where, you know, all the stories of the braves of Zaytun, the bandits of Zaytun, the battles fought in Zaytun. And you also know all the stories of the monasteries that used to be in these mountains, monasteries that were created in the time of the apostles. They're called Arakelashen because they were built by apostles. And where these monasteries were full of treasures from medieval times, but they also had active workshops and scriptoria where monks continued to create manuscripts and to write new uh, treatises on uh, you know various topics and when I was there it it just it hit me that of all these treasures in these monasteries in these mountains the only one that had survived to our day was the Zaytun Gospels in wow. two in two parts wow. each part on one side of the world but it had survived and so I had this very strong sense that this this object and here is Zaytun. Zaytun, really I want to bring this up to people place. see. Yeah, what beautiful an incredible shot. Wow. Place. 
Um, I mean, it's almost nestled between these two. No, I, I, it's heavenly, it's I think. So it's beautiful. It is. I mean, people it's call so cool. it uh, the Eagle's Nest, Adzve Point, but, and you really understand why they call it that. I mean, to get here, to get to this viewpoint, you've traveled up the mountains for a long time. And now there's a highway, there's a modern highway. Uh, so, oh, imagine, so there is a, okay, yeah, to there connect is to There's a road Zeta. that okay. leads there today, but imagine before the First World War getting up there. You could only go there with a Zetun Sea guide because these were treacherous mountain roads. And especially in the winter when it's snowing, you, you know, it is the eagle's nest. I mean, you see why it was called there. Now, um, is it, um, uh, I, I, as far as the town, is it uh, very like, is it like a little village or is it more, has, is it advanced at least a little bit as far as, you know, um, agriculture or, or just as far as food coming in mm -hmm. out, or is it just mm -hmm. like everybody grows their own stuff? Everybody bakes their own stuff. Are there stores, you know, yeah. or is it just like a village village? <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, these mountains, you know, Marash is a, is still a pretty big city. There's a military base there. You know, there's, uh, I don't know the number of pop populations. Now there's a, a huge Syrian refugee population there as well. Um, and Marash is a pretty big city. And so Zaytun and the, the city, the towns on the mountain are, you know, up up the, the mountains from Marash. And uh, they're... Um, Oh, here. Uh, oh, I love that. Let me picture. go back. Yeah, yeah, let me go back. Yeah. yeah, this is a picture that my friend Carol Bertram took. And so I have this hand drawn map, a photocopy of a hand drawn map. Do you know who it was drawn by? If there are any history buffs among your um, uh, your uh, your audience, you know that uh, Zaytun was the center of a major um, a rebellion in insurrection mm -hmm. in 1895. The Armenians of Zaytun um, rebelled against the Ottoman government mm -hmm. and yeah. held the Ottoman government at bay for, um, I think, almost a year. And one of the leaders of that insurrection um, uh, is a young man who's uh, pen. He was a Hunchakian. Um, a, a revolutionary whose pen name is Arasi. And so this map is from his memoirs. This is, uh, you know, he... Oh. I think there was a picture of that. Let me see. Is Maybe. this it? Yes, that's it. Yeah, okay. The, the oh, handwritten okay. one, 1895. That's uh, okay. So you can see where he says, "Who sees so north? Beridler is the the big mountain right above yeah. Zaytun, and he also he marks sacred places. He marks military areas in the mountain. And so I had this map and a number of other maps and my local hosts. Um, you know, it it it's he has it's drawn so this. Cool. Uh, from memory, right? And he's not, you know, a, a yeah. cartographer. He's drawn this from memory when he was in exile. And, you know, it's more or less, you know, it, it guides you to various places. So that's what I used. I mean, that was my my field work. And uh, you ask Vic, uh, what are, what's this, what are these towns like? You know, the, um, in this part of Turkey, you know, they're not that developed. And I had a very poignant conversation with uh, a woman who lived next to the citadel of Zaytun and who wanted to host me. I mean, you know, the wonderful tradition of hospitality that we know from our own families. It's of like, course. you know, of course you're going to come in and drink tea with me. And so, um, you know, he, he, she told us the, the story of her life and one of the, 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 you know, the, the pain that she had is that all of her sons had gone out uh, yeah. to the cities to work. And, you know, that's such a universal, um, you know, feeling when you're living in a place uh, in a part of the world where maybe it's uh, it's difficult. Life is difficult. There are not that many prospects. The young men leave. Um, so that's kind of what, um, you know, Zaytun is like right now it's a beautiful beautiful place and they do grow stuff though it's so steep that it's uh, you know not everything grows there it's really challenging um and these are images that i found uh, thanks to my very dear friend vahe tashjan who is dr vahe tashjan who is a historian and the founder of the website hushamadian 
Um, he lives in Berlin and he found these photos in the Jesuit archives in Beirut. And these are really rare photos of pre-genocide Zaytun. Um, mm. And I was never able to find photos of any of the churches in Zaytun. Uh, just these sort of shots of the city from afar. It was a very unique place. Were there were there any remnants of or anything that was converted into a mosque? Let's say right in um, Zaytun. Uh, yeah, the mosque in Zaytun is newly built, but okay. there were a few remnants of the um, Armenian past. Yeah. Um, if you scroll forward, Vic, maybe I think I included some of those photos. Yeah. There's um, a fountain. Uh, I, I want you to talk about that, um, you know, the the stories that they tell about the Armenians. Yeah. Because there's a big, um, almost like a brainwashing, even between Armenian towns, between Zaytun and Marash, and that the Marashis were the good Armenians. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because they were peaceful, yeah. uh -huh. because they, they basically followed order, yeah. but Zaytunsis didn't. And, and I want yes. you to talk about that. I mean, yeah. obviously... You mentioned this, this book is yeah. it was excellent. So uh, if you can talk about that. Yeah. So here we're seeing an example of uh, New Zaytun. If you go forward, Vic, I'm, I'm just going to. Uh, oh, yeah. This is. Oh, uh, that one? Okay. Yeah. This is the fountain of Zaytun, Barach Pur. These, these uh, very cold water that will cure your illnesses. Um, and uh, in this fountain too, there was an inscription and you, you're seeing where the inscription used to be that was yeah. scraped away. Um, in this course. case, we know exactly when that happened, uh, April 8, 1915, when the Armenians were herded out of Zaytun, the, the leader of the, um, the, the Ottoman military contingent that was supervising this ordered the inscription to be erased. We know this from survivors' narratives, and we know his name. I, I just uh, choose not to memorialize him today. Good. But yeah. um, I was about to say, should we go find him? <laughs> <laughs> kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, I, the, the, you know, the first, <laughs> the first World War was so devastating that, um, you know, chances are good that um, he's, he's, yeah, things yeah. did not end Expired. up Expired, well. yeah. Anyway, um, so uh, if you move forward, I think I have. Oh, oh yeah. So this so is a awesome. bath. And if you go one more. So this this man, you know, he was a, he was a very nice man. And he, you know, he I didn't know him. He saw me wandering around. He immediately he knows, you know, of course, this is an Armenian who, who's here. Right. I mean, why else would anybody go yeah. up to this village and wander around? Um, and he was so kind to he and his wife. And he wanted to show me um, this uh, building that, uh, you know, he uses for his donkey. And there was also a chicken there. And uh, so this was his architecture. I mean, the, the, it's a stone bath. Um, and the floor was laid with, um, you know, stones of different colors. Um and, you know, it was part of old Zaytun and he knew it too, right? Um, and we didn't talk about that. I mean, he just wanted me to come and see it. And then he gave me a gift of an egg that his chicken had just hatched. And you know, so it's <laughs> this combination, but it's this combination of, you know, a really nice village guy, but he knows why I'm there, right? And yeah. what is this a remnant of? But we also know not to talk about that. And yeah. um, not far from uh, from Zaytun, there's a monument. I don't think I included a picture in this. Um, uh, oh, somebody says he looks Armenian. See, you know, yeah. everybody <laughs> looks like my Uncle Toros there. Yeah. It's uh, very familiar. So uh, he, um, there's a monument. I don't think I included that image uh, in my PowerPoint. But uh, there's a, a monument erected, I think, in the 80s or 90s. This is the old road to Albistan. And that monument place. is one that specifically erected to vilify Armenians, sort of the bad Armenians of Zaytun. Yes, that's what I wanted you to talk yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I went there with my Turkish host and, um, you know, it's very interesting how, um, you know, how people are schooled to enforce certain silences. 
Uh, I mean, it, it's a very strong taboo. I mean, it's it's deep. And when you talk to Umit, uh, Umit Kurt, uh, who is from Ein Tab, not far from here, and he, you know, ask him. And, you know, Umit is an amazing person, amazing person. And so when you think of what is the norm in the Ein Tab that he's grown up with and that he has chosen to face these issues, head on and to talk yeah. about them um what that means what that portends i mean he is an amazing person uh, and so you have these people as well um so it's it's tough i mean it's really really tough uh to go on these um on these trips it's so yeah. so it's not just a visit it's really a pilgrimage you know, um, my parents, and I've mentioned this before in past episodes. They they went on a um, uh, from they went on a trip through Western Armenia, and obviously you start from Istanbul and then you take your buses and go. And one thing my mom told me, you know, and and they have videos of it as well. She's like, the further we started going east, the more undeveloped it got. Mm, yeah. yeah, as yeah. if they they. I don't know. Part I've, of me I've goes. I've driven. Part of me feels like I. Yeah. I feel like they know that they shouldn't do anything to these places because one day it's, it it's might yeah, it's really end odd. up back to us. I mean, I along, hope so. But along the coast, it is. I've told you about yeah, it. Along yeah. the coast, it's developed. But, but anywhere inside, like when you, if you were to go south on the eastern side, like towards Vaughn, yeah, it's, it's like undeveloped country. Yeah. And and that eerie feeling that you were talking about, and and she mentioned that too. It's like, you know, these people obviously this is they're not from 1915. They're you know they they, they had nothing to do with that. But at the same time, they, they have that like you said warmth, that hospitality, and everything. You know, um, and even if they find out you're Armenian, they're very nice to you. Yeah. But there's yeah. this weird yeah. thing between you two oh, where yeah. you're like, yeah. okay, I know it wasn't your fault. I. It, it, and they know it's not their fault, but they mm -hmm. understand that it was something in the past, but mm -hmm. it, you can't talk about it. Mm -hmm. Like, it's so bizarre. Yeah, yeah. It's it's very bizarre. It's very bizarre. Yeah. And um, in certain parts, uh, maybe not least. so much Marash, but you mentioned Van and Diyarbakir. These are places where uh, part of the reason why they, they are so underdeveloped is that they're simmering conflict with the Kurds. The valid point, yeah, especially around the south, yeah. So yes. layers and layers, and you know, Kurds have gone through. Uh, I mean, there are many different kinds of Kurds. They are not all the same. They don't all mm -hmm. think the same. But mm -hmm. They've gone through a lot of, um, you know, stages of thinking where they've. Some of them have come to the realization that wow, you know, we were involved in the Armenian genocide as perpetrators, and now it's our turn. Yeah. We are being discriminated. We are yeah. being subjected to to something uh, horrifying. And so some um, Turkish leaders have been at the forefront of genocide recognition and so on. And, you know, it's very, very complicated. It's very complicated. It's, it's difficult. Yes, it is. Um, so, but that's what uh, traveling in these parts of Turkey is. It's incredibly meaningful. Um, but it's all, it's hard. No, um, oh, oh, no, sorry. go ahead. Go, 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 go ahead. Just go don't ahead. forget your thought. Bye bye, Bo. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what I was going to ask, I just lost my train of thought. Thanks. <laughs> no, but I was going to ask you, did they know about the, did you ask them about the gospels as far as, did they know anything oh, about so it? So that's so interesting. Um, I had a couple of really interesting conversations because, you know, I'm, I'm not I, I'm not going to lie. I was always very open. If somebody asked me a question, I always told the truth. So uh, people often ask, like, are you here because like your family is from here? And in my case, my family is not from Zaytun or Marash. Um, and so I had pictures of the Zaytun Gospels on my phone and I would show people these things. And. I think a lot of people were really amazed that there are in a great museum in America, there's something from our neck of the woods and people go to see it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's almost, you know, it's, um, I think it's a lack of, uh, 
if you just don't know. This is news to you. Yeah. It's news to you that, wow, this thing, really? People here made that? Mm-hmm. It's so it's it, it, it's a very strange moment. I mean, I think it's 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 sincere that moment of wow, I just didn't know. Um, and um, I think this is something that many of us who are you know Armenians and travel to Turkey, maybe we don't realize how the vacuum of information regarding Armenian life there. Um, so it it can come as a complete surprise that wow really in Romgla people made pretty things that great museums now pay millions of dollars to collect. I mean yeah it's um, yeah yes. that was a, an unexpected thing for me. And then I'm another sure. question that people ask: Wow, in your religion, you there's pictures of people in your yes books. thank you thank yeah. you for bringing it up. I, was, I knew i forgot something uh but yeah you talk about that that's yeah. so interesting yeah i had a very interesting conversation with um you know a, a friend in marash and um you know of course he's a, a muslim a pious muslim and uh, so he asked that question and um yeah and i said yeah you know in our holy books we paint i mean not always armenian medieval armenian books don't have a ton of pictures right they have very few is it yeah we have pictures of people because Mm -hmm. in islamic um, uh, culture religious books don't always have sometimes they do but in general you don't expect that yeah, so that was an interesting conversation. Interesting. Yeah, that must yeah. have been because I it, it never dawned on me until this conversation. I mean, it's true. Wow, it just hit me right now. Yeah. Well, I'll see. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> was that your I, question? No, that was not my question. <laughs> all right, I'm still hanging on to my question very tight. Right. I wanted to know. I wanted to know how easy it was or how difficult was it for you to be able to kind of have free roam in the areas that you have visited. Right. Well, at the um, time, very the, easy. At yeah. the time, I, I don't know if now is different. Mm-hmm. The only thing that I would say now may be different is in areas close to the Syrian border because of, you know, sure, the, with the sort of military yes. situation. Yes. I would be super careful. But um, yeah, no, it was uh, it's actually very easy to travel in Turkey. People are super nice. Uh, super nice to women traveling alone, especially, mm-hmm. um, you know, yeah, no, it's, um, yeah. It's now, when easy. you, obviously, when you mentioned you're Armenian, there was no hostility towards you and nothing? Like... Not to my face. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, yeah. I, um, yeah. I mean, I, I, not when I was traveling. I think that the, the tradition of hospitality is very strong. And, you know, it's something that I admire. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful cultural trait. Uh, yeah. And, you know, you have come to visit our part of the world and you're welcome. And and that's it's wonderful. Yeah. Um, going back to the, man, um, uh, the manuscripts, one thing, can you talk about and somebody had commented, I, I, I wanted to ask that earlier, but how it ended up in the United States? Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, so that's a that's an interesting story, and um, there are um, it, it's a very poignant story. Um, so after Zaytun uh, in 1916, the manuscript ended up in Marash. And uh, it stayed in Marash. You can read all the details about this in my book. Um, it stayed in Marash until 1922, February, the Battle of Marash, um, where the manuscript was lost in the snow. The person who had it, it was a, a terrible blizzard the night of uh, February 22, um, almost uh, 100 years from now, right? February 22, 1922. Yeah. And um, uh, so the Gospels was lost in the snow, but then a Turkish man found it and he, um, he took this book and he began to have nightmares, where terrible nightmares. He had no rest 
where a fearsome figure, an older white-haired figure, appeared to him and commanded him to return the book to its people. And so he went to find the nearest Armenian he could find who happened to be um, a, a local gentleman, a, a dentist uh, called Melkon Atamian. Um, and this is according to the recollections of his son. And so Melkon Atamian was, uh, you know, a normal person. And he could, uh, in the sense that he was not a priest or a historian, and he could see that this is a sacred book, but he didn't know anything uh, about it. So, and uh, the Melkonians were preparing to emigrate to the United States, um, leaving Marash, where they saw mm -hmm. no future for Armenians. And uh, so he didn't want to take this book with him. It was the roads were dangerous. They would surely be robbed. And so he consulted with some of the elders of the remaining Armenian community, and they decided to entrust the book to the uh, American missionary who lived in Marash, somebody named James K. Lyman, um, about whom we have a lot of information because he was an American missionary and wrote about wrote reports about his time in Marash. And Lyman had been in Marash for many, many years, and he was trusted by the Armenian community. And so the elders decided that they would give the book to Lyman and ask Lyman to hold it in trust for them. And so that's what they did. But while they were planning to do that, the teenage son of Mr. Atamian, Hagop Atamian, who was 13 years old at the time, Wow. Um, he and his father had looked through the pages of this book and this book had enthralled him. I mean, he didn't know anything about medieval theology, but just like the artistry of this book enthralled us yeah. earlier, I'm sure he had the same experience. And so young Hagop, 13 years old, a teenager, he knows that the elders have made this plan that the book will be left behind and they're going to move to America. And he doesn't know any the unknown, right? And he decides, and this is a statement that he makes, he tells the story in 1983 in his own words. And he says that after I learned that, I decided that I had to take some something of the book with me to quote he says to prove that we had existed that wow. our story had not been manufactured our story in marash he says this in 1983 a few years before he dies and so he's the one this 13 years old 13 year old kid makes this momentous impulsive decision he's going to keep some of these pages and so he keeps them. We, we don't know if he told his father. And uh, the elders uh, leave, leave the book with Lyman, and Lyman kept his word, and he eventually uh, took the book to uh, the Patriarchate of Constantinople, uh, as he was asked to do, uh, whereas the pages traveled with the Melkonians and went through a very difficult journey to Aleppo. And from Aleppo, they sailed to the uh, United States and they arrived at Ellis Island and they were admitted. They became Americans. Wow. Hagop mm -hmm. and his family moved to Massachusetts. He lived in Watertown, Massachusetts, very modest man. He had a corner uh, bodega, corner store. I was able to speak to his daughter, Sonia Atamian Reeves. A very modest man, and he, they, he kept these pages as an heirloom, as a mem memory of their of Marash. Yeah. And he showed it to some priests and some trusted people, uh, but he never intended to sell it. So after he passed away, um, the pages went to another member of the family who eventually sold them. Oh, wow. Yeah, but what the pages a, stayed out of sight. The pages stayed yeah. out of sight for 70 years. Yeah, that's that's the amazing part about this is he hung on to them for that. Now, long. They sold yes. it to an Armenian family, right? No. No. Uh, it, the the Atamians or the one member of the Atamian family who came into possession of the his name was Gil Atamian. He's deceased now. 
Um, he, he's a very interesting guy. I've learned a lot more about him after I uh, wrote the book. So there should be another chapter about him. Very interesting guy. So anyway, he, he was, you know, a businessman, a very savvy guy. And uh, so he showed it to a priest and um, at the time, um, the, uh, the, in New York, at the Morgan Library and Museum, which is a wonderful museum that has a major collection of medieval books, um, they were doing a major exhibition of Armenian art, one of the first great exhibitions of Armenian art in the United States called Treasures from Heaven. This was 1993. And so uh, one of the priests associated with that, you know, uh, they he saw the pages. Really, they could tell this is amazing, and uh, the curators of that show, Tom Matthews and Roger Wick, um, after some research, they realized that these are the missing canon tables of the Zaytun Gospels. In the meantime, the mother manuscript had gone to Armenia, where it was recognized as the first known, first signed work of Toros Roslin. And so they put two and two together, like, wow, these are the canon tables uh, by Toros Roslin, the most important Armenian. Now, did Armenia ever, like, almost go on an investigative journey to try to find them or they just good question yeah they, they didn't it's, know about it or like they didn't care for it i'm just curious knowing that they had the book and these pages are missing what did anybody yeah, even I, attempt yeah, I or wonder, try i wonder if these things sometimes come up as like a revelation to them you, you know, know it's it's not uncommon to have pages missing from books either because they have simply fallen out or decay or i mean it's a 700 year old book um so you know people who examine the book and there's a couple of you know uh dis descriptions of the book that have come down to us people note that oh the, the canon tables are missing but how is anybody going to know where they yeah. are right yeah and so 1993 uh, it so happens that one of the people working on that exhibition helen evans who is now the curator of byzantine art at the metropolitan museum of art had just finished writing her dissertation on on what toros roslin she had just returned from research in the republic of armenia and so she put two and two together. I mean, it's amazing. Some would say miraculous, right? Yeah. That um, this moment would happen. And so once uh, it's, a work is identified as the work of Toros Roslin, I mean, the value, the price. Of course. So. Um, well, and, um, and obviously the Getty, <laughs> you know. <laughs> It's a masterpiece, right? Yeah, and uh, yeah, the, yeah, the Getty is. collect uh, the Getty only collects masterpieces, wow. um, and so they um, they purchased um, it well, at the time. The, that's their business motto. They have to because that's what's going to draw the especially in that know. big pretty building that they have. Yeah, you know, you better. Um, I want to uh, to our audience uh, who's listening. Thank you, everybody who's joined us and and uh, you know watching on YouTube, Facebook um and twitter and twitter <laughs> uh if you have any questions uh for hernar please f uh, feel free to ask uh i'm gonna scroll up see um if there was we any question anything. we missed anything sorry i've just been uh trying to but uh let's see here uh can you read the you see the comments right hernar do you see yes them? yeah uh i think by uh, this one by abiding uh biting in truth asked uh is the professor familiar with michael e stone's work he is uh, translated, he has translated, a translated a lot of, uh, of old armenian manuscripts yeah. to english most work is from jerusalem yes i believe michael stone uh is a is now retired he's was a professor at hebrew university if i'm not mistaken yes he is an armenologist um, yes, I'm a little bit familiar mm -hmm. with his work. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. so glad that uh, you were a fan of his work as well. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we got some. Oh, uh... somebody has that book, Treasures from Heaven. It's Aline. Yes, I mean, it's a great book. 
Okay, awesome. Um, now we, you know, we don't want to give too much away from the book, uh, no. and I want people to go buy this, please, guys. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm like a quarter into it. Even if I could call that a quarter, being into it, it's, it's, it's a great read. Uh, some amazing people have reviewed it. Um, tell us about the awards that you won because of this book. Yeah. So huh. thank you. Well, you know, this book was so outside of my comfort zone it was uh and while you know i was writing it you know you never know if anybody else is going to be interested because you become obsessed with something and you go down these rabbit holes and you're doing research and you're learning about you know how how many kilos of chickpeas they produce in Zaytun. <laughs> and, you know, that that's really interesting to you. And <laughs> you don't know if anybody else is going to care. So after um, the book came out, you know, we, my publisher and I, uh, Stanford University Press, I had a wonderful editor, Kate Wall. Um, we really didn't know what, you know, is anybody going to be, is anybody going to, care or not yeah um how is it going to be received i mean a lot of people were very dubious that i was writing about you know a legal dispute it's messy there's bad feelings nobody wants to hear that it's boring i heard that a lot this is so boring nobody cares it's inside baseball um so you never know right you never know yeah. and uh i remember one day i got up early the book came out in february and uh, my dear friend, Sato Mohalian, who has a wonderful book called Feast from Ashes, um, published by the same publisher. And early in the morning, I'm in my kitchen, you know, looking for the coffee. And she calls and says, did you see the New York Times? And I'm like, of course not. I don't get the New York Times. <laughs> 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 and she said, your book is in it. And, um, you know, the New York Times book section has um, a section, if they, if they don't get review your book, they, they have a section called New and Noteworthy Books. Yeah. And uh, they had included this in New and Noteworthy. And it was like, oh, my God, that's amazing. I have to go buy the New York Times now. And it was amazing and so unexpected that... Um, the, the New York Times book review section would would do this. And what had resonated for them was like this mystery that this book that, that had been these pages that had um, that had been believed lost reappeared and then a lawsuit ensues. Um, and then, um, you know, it, 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 over the course of that year, it was so uh, amazing. I mean, you never take it for granted that somebody's going to read your book and they're going to appreciate it. It's always such an amazing surprise, uh, such a yeah. happy surprise. And um, the, the book won a, a book award from the Society for Armenian Studies, which is so meaningful to me. Um, because they really know about Armenian yeah. things. And so if they think your book is okay, then it, it really is meaningful. But then, um, and it was right um, right after the war, the conclusion of the, of the war in 2020, the book won uh, an award from the uh, Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association. They have a book award and they gave the award to this book. And that wow. was so deeply meaningful and it's the only book that has received an award from both the society for armenian studies and the ottoman and turkish studies association and you know it and during the war and during the war and and wow. you know these things don't happen very often um yeah, and so it amazing. you you never take it for granted it's amazing it's amazing but I think it's because this this story is an Armenian story, but it's also a Turkish it, story. Yeah, yeah. And it's also a universal story. Yeah. And I keep hearing from you, I've been um, invited by all kinds of uh, museums and manuscript collections, and that they want to talk to me about some of the issues that they grapple with with their collections, which is you know, where did these collections come from? Every object in a collection has a story. Yeah. Maybe not every story is as traumatic as the one of the Zaytun Gospels, 
But yeah. every story is meaningful and there's often trauma or loss or war. And now the, the thinking in the museum world is to, to also honor these histories that the books come with baggage. The books, the manuscripts come to a museum with their biographies and it's important to think about that. So I'm just so amazed and delighted that this book can be part of those conversations. Yeah. And I've well, learned so much. Of course. So. Oh, sure. Congratulations yeah. on those awards. That's that's Thank amazing. Yeah. I mean, Bravo. especially from the Turkish side. That's just the phenomenal. So um but yeah, uh, I can't see if my eyes. I need to really get glasses. I just, <laughs> I keep, I, I keep oh, trying to deny my age. But um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we are, we're younger than the Zaytun Gospels. Yes, uh, well, yes. This, is, this is a fact. <laughs> oh, this is a fact. We have. A, I, I'm glad uh, David brought this up. So we had an audience member when we did our New Year's Eve show. Um, uh, he had a great question. He asked. You know, if you were, if you had a time machine and you could go back, at what time era of Armenian history would you want to? Oh, that be? is such a great question. This is, this is, gonna be, we should ask, <laughs> this. we should ask this yeah, to everybody. Yeah, from everybody. Now on. That Connor, is Thank you, David. Such a great <laughs> question. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That is such a great question. Um, you want us to take a commercial break? No, no, no pressure. No <laughs> you know, pressure. actually, you know what? Um, you, you haven't gotten to this chapter yet, Vic, but my personal favorite chapter is the chapter on Aleppo. And there's a character there, Archbishop Ardavas Surmeyan, who is a survivor of the genocide himself. And he is the Archbishop of Aleppo during a very difficult time after the genocide. And he has to take care of refugees and re rebuild the community and help people who are devastated and literally starving. But he also is secretly an art historian and an art lover. And he sets for himself the task of saving Armenian art and especially religious manuscripts. Yeah. And his life intersects with uh, the Zaytun Gospels in very mysterious ways. And I guess if I could time travel, I would like to be there <laughs> and <laughs> be able to help him in his quest. And he does all kinds of behind the scenes things. He figures out because people are, are um, transiting through Aleppo because it's such a major hub. Mm -hmm. So the Melkonians, for example, on their way from Marash to the United States transit through Aleppo. And there's lots of other Armenian refugees who are coming through, some of them carrying fragments of their, you know, old yeah. churches. And so he's, uh, Archbishop Surmeyan is trying to figure out who has what, and he writes it down in his monumental uh, inventory, his monumental catalog, this uh, gospels with amazing illustrations, which was once, I don't know, in the, you know, Supnashan Monastery in Sivas is now in the possession of, you know, Toros. And he's, the last time I saw him, he was on his way to Marseille. So he's trying, he realizes that Armenian art is now spreading yeah. all over the, the world. And he's trying to keep track of it and save some of it. And he's one of my heroes. And wow. um, yeah, and so I guess I would like to be there to hear one of his sermons at the Church of Forty at the Martyrs church. in Aleppo. Well, that's that's a great dream, I guess. Um, have you have you done any um, like the ancestry thing to know where oh. do you know how far you go back, <laughs> like what area your your ancestors are yeah. from? As um, far as I I know where my ancestors are from. Um, my uh, father's family is from not too far from Zaytun, from Musada in sort of Cilicia, okay. and that's you know a very um, you know a, a place where um, you know a lot of empires have come through. So yeah. I don't know what my ancestry might say and my my mother's um family is from cairo so who knows 
Yeah. Who knows? It's funny. It, it, most of the uh, surviving Armenians now, so somehow we're all collect, connected to Gilikia. Yeah. My, yeah, yeah my, the, dad, my dad was born in Halib and, you know, grandparents are from Antep. Yeah. yeah. I think all Antep tea, yeah. but just again, like uh, my dad's most side, people though. are from that region. Yeah. I, I think it's also because it was so close to Syria, the ones who were able to flee or mm -hmm. make it through the deserts to Syria. Yeah. I think that's yeah. why we're all kind of, uh, most of the people, their DNA is coming out from there. Well, I think other um, places, the, the the extermination rate was much higher. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Um, well, this was great. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was. I We're mean, survivors. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading this book. Um, I'm actually in the process of buying it as everybody, we speak. Uh, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm you not have kidding. to go. I got, I got caught up. I'm like, hold on. I gotta go search it. And I'll tell you why. I'm sure. I'm sure you saw it in the sh in the chat. There's a bunch of people that were talking about buying it, and I'm like, oh okay, I, got, I gotta do it. This I gotta is do the it. book. Yeah, I gotta do wow. it. Thank it, you. It's called the missing pages, um, and it, confirmed. Thank I, you. <laughs> I am planning to finish this by next week, so um, that's my goal, uh, and then finish Umit's <laughs> book as well. But um, hey, it's better than watching TV, man. No, I know. I know. That's it. No, it's not that. It's just having time that's with it. with my schedule with three yeah. kids. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I just I know, it's, but it's just very tough. Saying. But uh, hang on uh, again. Thing, any anything you want to mention what's coming up are you first of all are you working on any other books or yeah. yep i'm uh working on a book about ani right mm -hmm. remember i was going to write a book where zaytun was going to be zaytun gospels was going to be one chapter ani was going to be another chapter so now each of these chapters are going to be their own books and Ani is, uh, so the Zaytun Gospels is a portable object. It travels, right? It ends yeah. up in Los Angeles and other places. But architecture doesn't travel. Place doesn't travel. So Ani is a place that remains rooted to very particular landscapes. So, um, yeah, I'm really, it, it's, uh, I'm learning a ton. I'm learning a lot about early photographers, people who were attracted to this, the amazing, you know, ghost city of Ani mm -hmm. and went into yeah. photographs as photography was emerging as an art form. There's some amazing things. Uh, I was able to spend time at the State History Museum of Armenia, where they have a collection of photographs and archives of Ani and the early Russian era excavation of Ani. So I'm learning amazing things. There are some amazing characters associated with Ani, archaeologists, priests, charlatans, uh, bandits, uh, mm -hmm. all kinds of people so i'm um that's I'm, that's that should be yeah. fun that should be fun to read yeah that really so that's fun to read. that's a global story that unfolds in one one specific place whereas the history of the zaytun gospels was a journey through space yeah so and when 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 can we anticipate for the book i don't you, know you don't know okay i don't know it's it's hard it's hard to yeah write of course this but it, it's fun and I'm learning so much. Uh, and there's so much out there that we don't know. And yeah. that's interesting. Uh, oh, yeah. And, and you know, obviously your friend, Christina Moranti, we've had yes. her on. Yes. And, um, we're going to yes. have her on soon again, but yeah, um, Love yeah it's Christina. amazing. Yeah, we did we did th that episode with her, and we're gonna have another one. We're gonna really, yeah. really dive yeah. deep into it. She is amazing. She, she is, is amazing. Yeah. She is. Um, uh um my you know you, the event plug that event that you were talking about earlier um uh february that people can, 17 yeah. uh it's going to be an online event uh maybe you guys can i don't know if you can uh post po a link we, we to it link. but yeah. if you look up a uh, fowler museum at okay. the at ucla f-o-w-l-e-r uh, Fowler Museum at UCLA is having a series of events to celebrate one particular Armenian manuscript, the Kalatsor Gospels, mm -hmm. that was okay. gifted to them. It's in the um, 
collection, UCLA collection. And on February 17, we're having a wonderful online event. And I'm going to be there. Maggie Goshen from Aradiskijian Museum. Uh, Elizabeth Morrison, the curator of manuscripts at the Getty, uh, is going to be there to talk about a new uh, manuscript le leaf that they have recently purchased that is absolutely beautiful. It was created. It's an Armenian manuscript created in Iran. Um, and uh, we're also going to talk about the Galatzor gospel. So it should be really fun. Okay. And uh, my agenda with that event is to let everybody in LA know that these treasures of Armenian art exist in LA and that we should, and it's incredible that there are these collections of Armenian art in LA and we should celebrate them. Of course. Of course. Now, is this going to be only online or... Yes, unfortunately, okay. it's okay. going to be online, okay. Okay. but it will it will be archived too, so okay. you can watch. Well, it. yeah, just email. I mean, just send me the yeah, link. I'll, we'll, yeah. we'll share it on our uh, social okay. media and and make sure we tag you on it. Um, anything else you want to mention? Thank you so much. It, I, I've enjoyed this conversation so much. So uh, the have we. Pleasure, so is have ours. Uh, pleasure is ours. First of all, thank you for doing this in such short notice. Um, and and it's been great we've learned so much uh there's so much more to talk about this unfortunately you know okay. well well how about this how about we both how about we both read through this all right and then maybe invite her back well we're gonna have her go back anytime. we're, we're gonna anytime. have her back. this stuff how about yeah. that yeah well um uh, again we'll, we'll we'll talk later but uh Best of luck with the new book. Hopefully you, you finish it soon and we get to read that as well. Yeah. And yeah. everything you're doing for our culture, uh, for teaching uh, this generation, next generation, other cultures about us. And and it's 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 great yeah. work that you're doing. So thank you so much for, thank for everything. You. Thank and for you. being with us. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Again, pleasure's yeah, ours. Pleasure's we, we all are. ours. Yeah. Seriously. Um, it really is. So um, I, I guess till next time, uh, you take care of yourself and we'll, we'll chat offline later. Yep. Manak right. uh, Thank you. All right. Bye. Well, that was amazing. Let me turn yeah, this off. That was turn great. This off. All right. Well, thank you, Ignat, for doing that. That yeah. was amazing. Yeah, on a whim. Yeah. On a uh, whim. I love these interviews and I, I love it when we have these amazing intellectuals on and you learn so much, you know, and, um, and you get like, I don't want to stop, but <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, six months ago, think about it, six or seven months ago when we first started doing this, maybe longer. Yeah. Think about how much your brain is swelled with information <laughs> about our culture and our heritage, man. I'm telling you, man. And even even anything associated with it, yeah. not necessarily just focused on what we're doing, yeah. But or our culture, but everything around the world, everything world history related, it's just unbelievable. I know, I know. It's um, addiction, man. To our audience who joined us live, thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Guys uh, I hope for you guys had around. a great time, and thank you for the questions. Uh, this will be on all the platforms, so you can, if you missed the beginning, you can go back and rewatch it. Um, do we have any announcements at the end of the show? Um, do you want to announce the little thing we talked about earlier, or no? Which, not yet. Which, which there's like five little things. Which one? <laughs> the uh, the Vartan thing. <laughs> okay, we'll mention it on um, next one. We can. Yeah. But do do we have it set in stone? No, no, not yet. Okay, not we'll mention yet. it later. Okay, so okay. that's the thing. Um, again, I want to mention our next live will be. Uh, he Nick. wanted he wanted me to personally deliver a vartan to your house, <laughs> Connor. I'm coming to Toronto, bud. <laughs> <laughs> Who's paying for the trip? You are. Uh, seriously. Um, all right. So uh, yeah, next live show. Uh, don't forget, it's with Ruth Tomasian Nartovan from Project Save. That is next Saturday. This is going to be Saturday, guys. So wake up. Well, it'll be eleven. Hopefully, everybody's wake. Uh, you know, up by that time. Have your coffee. Eleven a.m. Pacific Coast Standard Time. Uh, that's going to be a great show with some amazing visuals. Yeah. Um, so besides that, I think you know. Go to our website, buy our sculptures, <laughs> support the show. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. everybody who has supported We're, us. Thank you so thank much, you. guys. Yeah. Uh, this is for a great cause uh, and we appreciate it. Anything else you want to mention? No, no. no. Thank We're you. For, thank you for sticking around, guys. I've been reading all the comments. I'm, I'm happy that was I know both of us are really happy you guys enjoyed that. Um, yeah. You know, got a lot more cool content like this coming up. 
thank you for the continued support yeah all right so um as always you know uh end of the show we gotta say it respect one another love one another and until the next episode take care of take yourselves care. take care guys Not off yet, I'm just gonna move it down. Uh, but I muted us.